we've talked about how you could do exploratory data analysis if you had one categorical variable. And now we're going to start thinking about how that changes if you have one quantitative or numeric variable. Um, and if we're trying to characterize one quantitative variable, we might want to do a data visualization, like a dot plot, a histogram, a density plot, or we might want to say something about the center, shape, and spread of the distribution. So we're going to talk about some measures of center, which are mean and median. We're going to talk about some ways to describe the shape of a distribution. And then in the next section, we'll talk about measures of spread. So I have some data about movies that were released in 2019. I think these are the, uh, the highest grossing movies of 2019, but I've ordered them by release date. So you can see some that came out in April, some that came out in August. I've got the title of the movie, and then I've got the amount of money that it made domestically, internationally, and then the last variable that you can't probably see the name of, this is the world uh, box office. So I think that's sort of the combination of the international box office and the domestic box office. So the movie Little made uh, 49.21, well it probably wasn't 49.21 dollars, I, it turns out that it was in millions of dollars, but I just divided by 1 million so that I didn't have really really long numbers on my screen. So this means $49,210,000. And then there was Hellboy, Breakthrough, The Curse of La Urena, Avengers Endgame, which made a ton of money. Um, Shazam apparently came out that year. So we've got a bunch of movies. Um, I'm showing you the first 10, but I think that I have the top 100. So I've got quite a few movies in here. And if I wanted to visualize um, one variable, this is the world box office, and I could make a dot plot. So every dot on this plot represents one movie. So here's a movie that did not make very much money. Um, let's see, this must be $500 million about here because this is a thousand million dollars. Um, so some of them uh, made very little money, some of them made a lot of money, but every dot represents one movie. In synchronous class we're going to make a dot plot of our own heights where we're going to put a dot on the plot for ourselves. I am 5'2", so I would put a dot for me, um, and we'll see what the distribution of heights in our class is. Another type of visualization that we could make is a histogram. So in a histogram, you break the data into bins. So this is movies that made, uh, it looks like between negative dollars and, and just a few million dollars, right around zero. Um, and you count up how many movies were in that category. So here there were maybe six or seven movies that made very little money. Uh, then there were 30 plus movies that made a little bit more move money, you know, in the you know, 5 million to maybe 10 million range or something. Um, and then just maybe one movie way out here, one movie way out here. I think we saw those in the dot plot as well. Um, and the thing about histograms is they kind of look like bar charts, but they're two different things. So a bar chart works for categorical variables, and a histogram is for quantitative variables. Bar charts always have the same number of bars as there are categories in the variable. So that's a fixed number of bars. But in a histogram, you have bins, and you can choose the number of bins or the width of the bins as the data analyst. So here's an example. These are just two versions of the same histogram that I showed you before. It's the world box office. Um, so this one I made the bin width uh, skinnier, so you can see these skinny little bins. And in this one I made the bin width wider, so you can see the wider bins. You can see kind of the same shape overall, but it does change the way that the distribution looks. Um, and I'm so interested in this that I wrote a whole essay about histograms, which I have linked on Canvas, um, but I'm going to show it to you uh, here as well. So essentially, um, I wanted to write this essay with my collaborator, Erin Lunzer, um, to sort of explain how histograms get created. And the basic way that they are created is you take a bunch of data, which I sort of visualized here as just a pile, 
Um, and then you line it all up in, uh, in the order. Uh, you can maybe not quite see, but there's some values down here, 24.4, 26.0. So we put all the values in order and we make a number line. And then we can map the values from uh, their order onto the number line. And for small data sets, we could just use a dot plot. So this is a plot where there's one dot per, uh, looks like car for this data set about cars. And we could do this again. This is a data set about the ages of NBA athletes. You can see the dots are getting piled up more because uh, there's multiple athletes that are the same age. And then if we go on to something like the delay in seconds between eruptions of Old Faithful, the geyser uh, at Yellowstone, now things are getting piled up. Um, and if we had a really big data set, it would be impossible to have all those dots. So that's why we like a histogram, is it lets us aggregate a little bit. And here's the way that we would make a histogram. We would divide the data set into bins, and then we'd kind of drop those balls down into the bins and count up how many of them fell in each category. So you can see some of these bins are taller and some of them are shorter. And that's a, a general idea of what the distribution shape would be. But the problem is that uh, the shape of the distribution or the picture that you see varies based on the bin breaks that you choose. So right now we're going from 80 to 100, 100 to 120, um, but we could adjust those. So we could leave the bins the same width and just scoot them back and forth. And that's going to change the shape of the distribution because more or less uh, of those balls will fall into that bin. Um, we could also vary the bin width. So leave the beginning of the bins the same, but change how wide they are. You can see some different pictures emerging here. Um, and then in this essay, we create uh, a playground where you can try lots of things all at once. Um, and this one doesn't work as well on the iPad as it does on the desktop. So maybe I'll show it to you when we're in synchronous class time as well. But you could go play around with it if you wanted. So that's histograms. They're kind of deceptively simple, but there's a lot more going on under the hood. Um, there's another type of plot called a density plot, which is just kind of a smoothed histogram. So it shows the same thing, but smoothed out. Uh, and those are the main visualizations that we use for one uh, quantitative variable. A dot plot, a histogram, a density plot. Um, we'll get to one more in a couple sections. So if we're looking at a distribution, um, one of the things that we might want to know about it is shape. And there's a few different shapes that we might give names. So one is a distribution that's shaped like this. So it has a, a large collection of values in one spot, and then it has fewer of them kind of reaching out in this direction. And this shape of distribution is called right skewed. Um, because we give it the name based on where the tail is kind of leading off into the distance. So the, the other option for skewness would be left skewed. So that's going to have a long tail reaching off to the left and then the bulk of the data over here. So this one is left skewed. And then the last shape that I'd like you to be able to identify is roughly symmetric or bell-shaped. So here's maybe a more or less symmetric or bell-shaped. So if I ask you to describe the shape of a distribution, you might say that it is right-skewed, left-skewed, or symmetric. Um, I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation here. So uh, we denote the sample size or the number of cases or observations by the letter n, small n typically. And then we could use x and y as variables. Um, and then we use little subscripts, the kind of like little mini numbers down below to denote the values of x. So x1, that would be the first value. x2, that's the second one, all the way up to xn, and that's the nth value. So for example, from my movie data, 
X1, the world box office for my first movie is 49.21. And then the next one is 40.79. And then you can't see all the way down to the bottom of this data set to the hundredth one, but I went and looked and it was 470. So I could think about all those different X's. Um, and the reason why we might want to know those numbers is if we're going to try to measure the center of a distribution. So center, shape, and spread are the big things. We talked about shape, now we're gonna talk about center. Um, and we have two main ways of measuring center. We have the mean and we have the median. The mean is the one where you just add up all the data values and you divide by the number of values. So x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 all the way out to x sub n divided by n, which is the total number of things in your data set. That's the mean. Um, and if we wanted the sample mean, we would denote that with the uh, notation x bar. So I pronounce that as x bar. Or if it was a mean taken from an entire population of data, then we would use the population parameter mu. So mu, that's the Greek letter. Um, it's kind of like a, a u with a long tail at the beginning. So kind of like that. Um, the median is another measure of central tendency, and I don't have a nice formula for you, but the way that we figure it out is we put all the data in numeric order, and we count in until we get to the middle value. Um, if there's an even number of values, then there's not one value right in the middle, and then you just take the average of the two middle values. So let's think about my movie data. Um, I found the median of the movie data was $122 million, and the mean is $268 million. So I'll put some dollar signs on there. So if we look at this plot, I can tell that uh, this line here is the median and this one is the mean. And the mean is gonna get pulled in the direction of outliers. So it's gonna get pulled out by these really extreme values um, out on the, the right tail, the right skew of this distribution. So the median is at the middle value, but the mean is adding up everything and dividing by n. So then what is an outlier? An outlier is a data point that is noticeably different from the rest of the distribution. And in the case of the movies that were released in 2019, um, out here, you might be able to guess that this is Avengers Endgame. And then I'm pretty sure that this is the live action Lion King. Um, and this is Frozen 2. So those were really high grossing movies in 2019. Um, and those look noticeably different from the rest of the distribution. We'll learn a more formal way to define an outlier, but these just look different to me. And then I'd like us to think about the idea of resistance. So a statistic is resistant if it is not affected by outliers. So the median is resistant, but the mean is not. So if I do these statistics with Avengers Endgame in there, the mean is $268 million, and the median is almost $122 million. But if I take out Avengers Endgame, just that one movie from 2019, now the mean is down to $243 million, but the median is still basically $122 million. So the median doesn't change very much based on the outliers. And then the question is, what should you do if you think that there are outliers in your data? So the main thing is think about if you think that uh, that data is a mistake. If it's a mistake, then you could take it out. But if it's not a mistake, you don't just wanna drop it. Like we don't wanna take out Avengers Endgame from the 2019 movies because it's legitimate data. It just did really well. Um, so we're not gonna just drop it, but we might consider doing our analysis twice, once with the outliers and once without to see how that affects our analysis. So that's some stuff about center and